In fact, the number of companies we have queuing up to take and pay these teacher interns is bigger than the number of interns we can provide. We want them to be literate of being able to read the room. I'm going to tell you a story about science, technology, policy. There's a concern around the world about how is it that we help young people develop in ways. The first is the technology, the second is the technology, the third is the technology. So good morning. Uh, teacher education was established at the University of Missouri in 1867. Since that time, deans of the College of Education have had to communicate messages to different audiences using various mediums or methods. In 1914, Evelyn Dewey visited the University of Missouri Lab School and descri she described what she observed in chapter three of the book that she co-authored with her father, John Dewey, titled Schools of Tomorrow. How did the Deweys hear about the University of Missouri Lab School and the training of teachers that was taking place at that time? How did the dean share that important work to facilitate that interest? Since that time, new technologies such as phones, radio, television, video, the internet, and social media became accessible. How did these technologies influence the delivery of the dean's messages? Context matter. When I began my role as dean, our campus was in the midst of a significant crisis that resulted in negative media attention and public distrust. Enrollments dropped, resulting in a 30% reduction in state funding for our college in a short period of time. Strategic relationships and communication are never more important than in the midst of a crisis. In every communication, we have to consider audience, message, and the method that we use to influence. In 2016, I co-authored a commentary for the Journal for Research in Mathematics Education that made the case that researchers needed to strategically position themselves to influence the general public, policymakers, and philanthropists, to name a few. The ideas in that commentary are also relevant to the ideas that we discussed yesterday. The components of positioning theory, one, positions, <coughs> two, storylines, and three, communication acts, have significantly influenced my approach with strategic communication as a researcher, educator, and dean. Today I highlight five examples of how we rebuilt trust and changed the narrative. First, our college began using innovative strategies to recruit undergraduates. For the past four years, I have filmed personalized congratulation videos to seniors in high school who have been admitted to our college. Sarah, congratulations on your acceptance to the University of Missouri College of Education. Last year, our design team decided that the video should include me riding a bird, a bird scooter pictured in the middle of the first row on the handout. Filming for this year's video starts next week, and I'm excited about the concept that, they ha that I will be communicating. This personalized relational approach is replicated with the use of Facebook Live Chats. This medium has served as a strong recruitment approach for undergraduate and graduate programs. We typically have 400 or more students view the archives of the Facebook Live Chats within the first week of hosting them. The result, when our campus experienced a large drop of freshman enrollment in 2016, the College of Education's enrollment did not decline, the only one on campus. This fall semester, our new enrollment had a 37.4% increase compared to last year. Second, we have an army out there. Our college has 45,000 living alumni, but more than that, teachers comprise one of the largest workforces in the United States. As Rick emphasized yesterday, our campus administrators now know that work, that workforce has the power to influence enrollment and state funding. I've begun to engage with our alumni in ways that we have not in the past. One innovative example is the use of Meltwater media monitoring. Meltwater identifies any news articles in the U.S. that mentions our alumni on a daily basis. I then send personalized letters to these alumni, recognizing them for their accomplishments. They respond with a financial gift, I did not anticipate that, or an offer to support the college. 
We are now engaging people that have not had contact with the college since they graduated, and they are advocating for the college on our behalf. Our army is spreading our messages. Third, we have all cons have to consider what communication to eliminate. Bruce just talked about this topic. Like other organizations, our email culture was out of control. Email was consuming our human capital. Faculty were not responding due to the sheer number of emails piling up in their inboxes. This fall, our college launched The Scoop, where information is posted and not distributed via email. One of the posts on the site, if you check it out, it's on the handout, and it um, gives a summary of the suggestions from research on how to reduce email and eliminate, um, it, just re reducing the uh, reply all helps a lot, believe me. Uh, one example um, is the reply all option, but all the examples are compiled in one document on the scoop. We also reduced the number of print publications that we produced as we moved to digital and video formats. Fourth, in 2016, I met with our campus news bureau, and I told them I wanted a press release each week. They informed me that there had been one press release for the College of Education in the last five years. I did not take no for an answer. The articles that have resulted about our research and impact are reaching across the globe, enhancing our relationships with alumni, donors, and policymakers. Fifth and finally, we have to consider the, the images along with the messages that we provide to policymakers. The bottom row of the handout illustrates examples of images that have been useful to changing the storylines. I was presenting to our state legislator in our state capitol. I was asked, Catherine, how is the College of Education doing? And I responded, we are thriving. We have 900 employees. He stopped me right there and stated, I wouldn't tell anyone that. I quickly realized I had framed the message incorrectly because he assumed we had too much money. Imagine that for education. <laughs> So I retorted, you should know that our state appropriations is about 10 million and our salary and benefits of our employees is 29 million. We secure grants and contracts to employ Missourians and generate tax revenue for this state. He looked at me and said, that is two to one. I would say it that way. I didn't correct his math. <laughs> Message matters. I came back to the office that day and said, I want an image that represents this idea. It is shown in the bottom row. When policymakers request information or a meeting with me, I recognize the investment of time to reach out has been worth it. In every communication, we have to consider audience, message, and the method that we use to influence. We have to prioritize and persist. We need to collaborate to advocate for the field and society. We cannot become complacent or take our feet off the gas. The Global Dean's Forum needs innovative communication strategies to advance education. I began the story with the Deweys. Who will visit the University of Missouri College of Education in the future as a result of our innovative communication? Hopefully all of you. Thank you for the opportunity.